Hello. In this SciShow Talk Show with Dr. Doe, something happened with the sound recording in the first half. So we had to rely on the camera audio, just the mic that's built into the camera, and that is not high quality. Our apologies for that, but we didn't want to like throw the whole episode away because it's good. So here's this conversation with Lindsay. Luckily, the second half sounds great. So you have that to look forward to. Thank you and enjoy. Hey there! Welcome to SciShow Talk Show. It's that damn SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff, and today we're talking to clinical sexologist Dr. Lindsay Doe. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Of Sexplanations, a uh, YouTube channel that we help produce. Yeah, and Sexplanations podcast that you help produce. I did. I was just a guest. Which is fantastic. Where we talked about a number of things, a great number of things. We went, we've ranged far. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we talked about was uh, the fact that we don't necessarily do a ton of research on sex in right. our world, which seems like, you know, sex is pretty important. It's how all of us exist, and also just a fairly important part of people's day-to-day -day lives. Yes. It's an important method of disease transmission. It's an important method of happiness creation <laughs> uh, and of, uh, you know, closeness, intimacy, relationships. And Reproduction. yeah, also, you know, having human beings exactly. still, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, maybe if you're not in favor of that, uh, but I am. There's I still like humans now. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what I, I meant people who are not in favor of any more humans on Earth at all, which is a viewpoint I have encountered. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of people, and I think that there should be plenty. I don't know if we should have the amount we have. Yeah, I, I would say. I'm a fan of people, yeah. and I'm a bigger fan of the planet. Oh, I disagree. I think that Earth without humans is very interesting, but not nearly as interesting. I really Big like, I really like people. Yeah. Show. Should humans exist? Leave your comments in the day below. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I like humans. It seems to me like this is a thing that we should study a lot. You study sex. And have. Yes. Um, Do you want to hear about that? Yeah, sure. So when I was in graduate school, which is around 2003, um, one of my earliest experiences with the lack of funding toward mm -hmm. sex research and the incredible amount of hurdles that are set up by our society for that was my master's thesis. It, its title is Phenomenology of First Sexual Intercourse Experiences Among Individuals of Various Levels of Sexual Self-Disclosure. And the reason why it was so long is because when you're doing research connected with the university or college, you have to go through what's called the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. And they take a proposal, in my case it was 30 pages, it's usually around 10, but mm -hmm. because I was working with human subjects and because I was talking to them about their sexualities, which at the time was a very sensitive subject, my proposal was much longer. Mm -hmm. And it had to explain every question that I was asking them uh, what I was going to do with the data, how it was protected, etc. For my classmates that were handing in much smaller and less comprehensive proposals, they would get theirs approved by the IRB round one. Mm -hmm. Mine took three rounds to go through. And even then, I have you know all of this research planned out, but now I have to get participants. So in comparison, you have the um, in my program, exercise science students and health promotion students, they were able to acquire, mm -hmm. you know, psychology 101 yeah. students, easy access, right, to these sure. huge pools. And this is, a, this is a general problem that there is in human uh, research, where yes. if, if you would like to study people of a broad range of sort of, you know, Experiences, ages, socioeconomic status. It's a lot easier if you would like to study, uh, you know, 18 to 22 year old college students right. because they're accessible and they're, they have free time. Whereas if you want to uh, be talking to a lot of different people who are like, so that's a very well studied population. Except for even, sex. Even in sex. Right. Because so my study ended up becoming what's called a phenomenology where you study the phenomenon of something, you know, a much smaller subject mm -hmm. group because it was so difficult for me to find participants in that. People just didn't want to sign up, even right. if it was anonymous, even if it was. Right. Hmm. So I had eight participants, two pilot participants. That is yeah. what, it, so the whole research study got changed because that's all I could access. 
And then from those eight participants, I wanted them all to have really high levels of self-disclosure because mm -hmm. I want them to be able to tell me about their first sexual intercourse experiences. But right. I wasn't able to access eight high disclosure. And so that's where you get the part of my thesis title, which is very levels of sexual self-disclosure. So, mm -hmm. so many barriers. Right, and you're also just going to have selection bias toward people who are more comfortable talking about that stuff, which is going to be maybe a different, you're going to get different data from that. I do see why it's hard. I see, especially now, especially if it's like, of course, like you have to get people to actually talk about it. Yeah. And uh, you, you can't just be like, so uh, I'm going to check, I'm going to check your personal history, and here's, uh, here's the first sex you ever had, and how it went. Um, and why and how, and it was all written down here. You, yeah, no, but it's all, all locked up inside. Yeah. So do you want to hear the history of some of these problems? Sure. And some of my favorite sex researchers who just pushed through the barriers? Okay. Okay. So one of the very first outlets for sexologists to kind of communicate with one another was a journal that was published in 1926. Okay. And then you have the Institute for Sexualisationschaft, which is the German name for the Institute of Sexology. Okay. And this accumulated thousands of artifacts, um, volumes of research, photographs, art, etc. But then the Nazis came along, and within three years of them being in power, so 1933 to 1936, mm -hmm. they had burned the entire institute down and all of the artifacts. Supposedly, some were rescued, though, and they have been <laughs> preserved in San Francisco. <laughs> uh, so then, from there, you have a lot of taboo around the subject, not a lot of access to materials, but Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey, comes along. He's been studying gull wasps for his <laughs> whole biological career. And he starts meeting with students who have no idea how their anatomy and physiology works in terms of reproduction. Mm -hmm. And so he shifts to start teaching a course on human sexuality. But you can only take it if you're married. Wow. Yeah. Kinsey's always fascinated me because it was like, he did this research and he found that, that like a huge variety of sexual experiences. But I, I was always like, how did he get that information out of people? Like, how do you talk to a person in a time when homosexuality is extraordinarily taboo and find out that so many of these people have had homosexual experience? I think people love talking about sex. Okay. It's just you gotta, giving them that permission to do it and yeah. establishing rapport so they feel safe with you as mm -hmm. whatever person who's right. reporting things, right? Eve Ensler put together what's called the Vagina Monologues, which are a collection of monologues based on her interviews she did. And she has one where she's talking to an older woman and the woman is happy like, why, you shouldn't be asking me these questions, this isn't polite. And then she gets to talk for the first time about how when she became aroused, there was this huge flood of liquid that came out and she hasn't ever told anyone about this and she's afraid to be sexual and she hasn't been. And then, you know, mm. in her 70s, she, post-interview, goes back and masturbates for the first time and has an orgasm. It was really exciting. So I think that when people are invited to have those conversations, then they're all about it. Mm -hmm. Right? You you like talking about sex. Yeah, I'm a pretty cars. open dude, though. Like, I, you know, I... How I had, I feel like I've, I had the trajectory that allowed that. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I feel like a lot of people, especially in Kinsey's time, did not. Like, it's taboo now, mm -hmm. but way more taboo then. But I guess, you know, if you establish that rapport and you make, the, make it very clear that this is not something that's going to leave this office, yeah, I think people do, like, actually tend to some oftentimes like to talk about it. Yeah, so but they did. It does, make it, it does make it difficult to research. If yeah. people aren't immediate, like, it's not like coming and like, tell me how many times you exercise a day. Because I, like, you try to find research on like, how much sex do people have? And it's like, mm. uh, yeah, small, it's true. small sample it's very studies. very hard for and, me yeah. to find stats on how often people are masturbating, um, how often people are having oral sex, how often people are having mm -hmm. same sex relationships. Yeah. yeah, it's very difficult. Are there barriers to funding that research? And it yeah. like, but why? Kinsey's why? research was just cut. Like it was, 
Game over. Sure, that's then. Like 2017 now. Is it still like, is it still that hard to get funding for this research? Because it seems like really important things to know about our society. The research about sex either exists because sex is some sort of problem and we need to understand what is causing this infection or how do we stop young people from early onset intercourse. And it, so it's a problem solving research. Early onset intercourse is an interesting way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Having sex for the first time yeah. early. Or it's about behaviors and pleasure, etc. And mm -hmm. that is definitely not funded. Hmm. Well, who, who would fund it? I don't who know. Who funds? Who funds just knowing things that, like that? A lot of the research we do does not necessarily have an end. You just want to know more about the world. We in the podcast talked about how to have sex in space. Mm -hmm. Where is the funding to send Dr. Joe <laughs> into space so that she can have sex? Is, is this been the end, at the end of this entire conversation? It's like, look, there's not enough research being done. There's, no one's funding the important sex studies like sending me to space and and someone else for sure. me to have sex with. I think my bigger resentment is that sure. bisex females can experience what's called ejaculation, squirting, surging, etc. Yeah. Right? There's a gush of clear liquid that comes out of some of their bodies. And there's all this really crappy research that's done with like, oh, it's beer piss, it's from drinking too much alcohol, or it's because you're hyperhydrated, or it's really just urine. And it's so sad to me because you have entire generations of people yeah. that are insecure about their bodies and their experiences because no one is out there willing to do the scientific collection of data so that we have actual answers. Yeah, it's strange, but I, I guess understandable to think that like we still have social taboos standing in the way of understanding physiology, particularly female sexual physiology. And we think that like we think we you know we're super progressive and like science isn't held back by social taboos, but it totally is. It totally is. The researchers that have impressed me, you want to hear them? Sure. Okay. On the subject of Kinsey, he was curious about what was going on and trying to understand sexuality so that he and his team called the inner circle could be better researchers. Mm -hmm. And they would all actually have sex together in his attic. So there were um, other men on his team and so it would be them and partners and his wife and they would all engage in sexual activity together. Wow. For research, <laughs> for science. <laughs> Who, whoever got the clipboard job is just like, okay. Yeah. Hold the clipboard key. <laughs> well, they videotaped it too. Oh, okay. At least that's how the story goes. Yeah. Then there's Havelock Ellis, uh -huh. who you're familiar with, yeah. because you have to roll that in the sex explanations episode. And he was having nocturnal emissions, right? Wet dreams. And he did his own research there to figure out whether or not he was going to die, like the medical field had told him. I think that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, if you're being you're told, like, but he basically, like what you say in the video is he was documenting his demise. Yeah. Like he thought he was like, well, I guess I'll do research on myself if I'm going to die of this disease that I have, mm -hmm. wet dreams, that I'll, 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 you know, keep track as I, as I decline to the grave. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I, I feel okay. I've been doing this for years now and I'm super not dead. He became a, a sex researcher. Good job, dude. Good job, too. You also know about one of my favorites, Antony von Leeuwenhoek, who made one of the first microscopes, and then that he found from Tozoa, which I think is yeah, like the right? first thing. You're like, I made a microscope. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look at blood, and I'm gonna look at sperm. Ta da! Yeah. I mean, why not? It's the, the two easiest fluids to access. Produce fluid. Yeah. Along those lines, there is a sperm psychologist named Dr. Joanna Ellingson, and she did some of the coolest research. So she was going to have a tubal ligation where you mm -hmm. go into the body and, and the fallopian tube, you can either tie it, cut it, okay. clamp it, etc. And so she knew she was going to have this procedure done. So beforehand, she had sex, and then she waited a period of time. And when she went under, she, before she went under, she asked the surgeon to cut out a chunk of her fallopian tube hmm. so that she could put it under a microscope and count exactly how many sperm from the 250,000 initially mm -hmm. made it all the way to the fallopian tube. It was under 10. Who That's cares? so cool to me. <laughs> right? 
Yeah. It's not an easy journey. No. And we wouldn't know things like that because right. no one's funding her to do that. She is just committed to the science herself mm -hmm. and willing to have sex prior to a tubal ligation. <laughs> what dedication! <laughs> and also, like, I want you to deliver me a piece of my body to me so I can put it under a microscope. It's pretty cool. It is. Why not just do that over and over again? Because you only have that one data point. Yeah, why not? Because nobody is funding it. I mean, that sounds like an awesome study to fund. And you guys have to have people have like sign this form before you do the ligation. We would like to harvest a sample from your body. This won't affect anything else. And then just a little microscope time, and, and we'd have more than one data point. Hank Green Sex Research Institute. Here, I got it. <laughs> How much? I got like 40 bucks. How much does it cost to get a bunch of fallopian tubes? <laughs> Definitely only 40 bucks. Okay. The last one we should probably talk about, well, we can talk about my, my commitment to science too, but John Money is famous for really looking at nature versus nurture. He was a psychologist, he is a psychologist, and this baby boy was, his penis was boshed during the circumcision. Mm -hmm. And so the parents took this baby, Bruce, to John Money, and he said, oh, well, you can actually raise him nurture him to be a girl mm -hmm. and so we'll just take off the penis and do some reconstruction so that it looks like a vulva and you can raise him as bread. A lot of how sex research goes is that there's trial and error or mm -hmm. there's using your own body or your own sexual experiences as the model from which you launch from. And so he did this and what ended up happening is, is that this young person who was being raised as a girl, yeah. hated their life and didn't understand and felt, you know, the gender dysphoria that we yeah. know now. Exists. So thought that they were a biological female their whole life. Yes. And then this doesn't fit. Yeah. This doesn't yeah. fit. And did do a gender transition to become David David Breyer, wow. but still ended up committing suicide. And because of all of that, right, of these self-sacrificing experiences, basically, we have the concept of gender. We have the difference between what you mm -hmm. are born with and what you or express. raised as. Or, yeah. 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 I got that is a terrifying, sad story. Yes. That seems like a, t a bad decision to have just said, well, this has gone bad. Let's make it kind of worse. If you think. We didn't know any better. Yeah. And I think that that's the case with a lot of sexuality right now that we don't know any better. And so we have people just yeah. trial and error. Yeah. So um, my own. Yeah. And we, we can end with that and then get on to the really cute animal. Um, <laughs> is that I was in high school having sexual experiences, surging myself. So I would ejaculate this liquid. And I looked it up online because that's where you go when nobody tells you. Yeah. And they were saying, yes, this is beer piss. This is because you're drinking too much, which I wasn't. And um, I did, there was you're so just, much confusion. You're just peeing on your partner is what, yeah. is what they're telling you. I am grateful that people have had these mysteries that they have pursued solving. But I wish that there was more yeah. research, more organized research. I don't know. To, to me, it seems like there, there's a lot of great research being done in the world. But maybe just the fact that like you don't want to get like if you're a researcher in sociology or psychology, you don't want to get like branded as one type of thing. You don't want to rock the boat because you're this is your profession and you have to do the thing that is going to lead to you getting tenure or getting research published, or like you know it, it might just be kind of uncomfortable, and so the research gets done less well. Like I'd be very interested to see research on the sociology of sex work for uh, pornography workers. And like, I feel like that's a really important thing to be looking at right now because it's, there's a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of new kinds of sex work happening with the internet. And I don't feel like we're looking at it because I think we don't like looking at it. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the things that you should look at is the ones that you don't want to look at oftentimes. Thank you quote. Unless it's the sun. <laughs> Don't look at the sun. Uh, is there research that you would like to do on sex? Like um, if the Hank Green Sex Research Institute existed, what would be your first project? I think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you think I have more money than I do. <laughs> um, there is some research being done, but I feel like there needs to be more done on the effectiveness of different sex education 
Mm -hmm. uh, especially because right now I don't know that we're really measuring the kind of sex education we're giving because a lot of it's self-taught now. Like, at this point, it's much easier to look up a video, like a sex explanations video, than to like suffer through an uncomfortable two-hour health lecture that's going to be affected heavily by the politics of the place that you live in, which is a kind of terrifying thought that education can be so heavily affected by politics. How has learning about sex changed in the last 10 years? Like, how are kids, like, because when it, like, I remember, like, you know, the bus stop and somebody, like, making it about 69, I didn't know what that was, and, like, there's no way for me to go find out why that's funny. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, ask your mom, and I was like, well, that's definitely not the thing. I know that's not the thing, so I shouldn't do that. Uh, but, like, now, just Google it. Mm -hmm. um, so how has that changed and how does that affect? And how is it affecting things like, you know, first sexual experiences or sexual behavior or, you know, teenage pregnancy, which I think is going down. That like, is going down. And yeah. Not like you're going down, but like. Yeah, yeah. temper. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, wow, I never thought of No, it's going down on the other timber. Yeah. Not you're going down. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, the amount, like the, age of first sex is, might be going up. Education, but also like, kids hang out with us. They're on the internet all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and understanding why that is and like what, what its effects are. And there's, there's a lot to be done there. That was not one set of research that I'm looking at. Well, if you ever get a microscope, mm -hmm. We already have plans. Right. Yeah. Do you get, you've got to do it the way that Lumenhoff did it and look at blood and look at semen. First two things is how it works. Yeah. It's the rules. And I'll go get a tubal ligation and you can have my globin too. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's so fascinating. Yeah. It's so I love people doing research on themselves. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. It, sometimes it goes very poorly, but it oftentimes to me says like, I need to know this and everything is in the way of me knowing it. Mm -hmm. And so the only way that I'm gonna figure it out is I'm gonna stick a needle into my own eye. Yeah. Let's come up with some alternatives. Right. Yeah. Do you want to meet an animal? Yes. It is the product of sex, like all animals are. Wait, no, that's not <laughs> 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 Jesse. Hey. Was this animal made by sex? Um, depends on what what you define sex as. I would say no. Yeah, sexual. No, se like, I'm thinking sex versus sexual reproduction. Two different things. Yeah. So it was sexual reproduction. That's when two gametes join from two different parents to yes. make a new animal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. As opposed to asexual reproduction, when the female just clones itself and yeah. puts all its own DNA, and then it grows into its. It's a whole same. other thing. Yeah, yeah. but the same yeah. DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't frog humping. So, so what's your definition of humping? So movement. Yeah. So, so um, genital to genital. <laughs> so cloaca, possibly Clo touching. But usually possibly. frogs are like spawn, like they lay the eggs and mm -hmm. then they, well, they inseminate the eggs. But that's I well, that that this this animal. So what they'll do so is the they'll they'll Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to bring her out? <laughs> Him out. How do you know Him. it's? Oh, you are He's stumpy. Cute. But, Stumpy's a jumper. Okay. You just do whatever. Just don't scream if he jumps on you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll be down. Yeah. Ah. yeah. You, get, you got <laughs> eye protection there, so you'll be good. <laughs> so this is, this is a male. Yeah. Um, and to reproduce, what they would do is he would clasp onto the female. So he would like, he's a, he's a white tree frog or an Australian green tree frog or in Australia they just call him green tree frogs or you can call him a dumpy tree frog. His name is Stumpy. I didn't name him. My husband named him, so he's Stumpy the Dumpy Tree Frog, and uh, <laughs> they uh, they live up in the trees. And to reproduce, the male would go down to, like above some standing water, and he would call out. He'd do a little mm -hmm. his little barking call, and then the female would come along if she's ready to mate, and then he would clasp, give her like a little a, a hug from the behind, and then the sperm and the egg yeah. masses would join and into like a little as the eggs are coming out as the eggs are Externally. coming out okay yep and then the sperm and then it creates little embryos into this big egg mass in the standing water and then tadpoles yeah exactly so basically what so you're saying is, is so, so yeah. it looks like you've, like they give a bear hug so it's kind of like you've brought an animal no that, that kind of blends the like where's the line everything's great at right some, at some point it is and is not sex, but we're not sure when it comes to Stumpy. Yeah, yeah, just depends on. Yeah, how well, how you count. <laughs> oh, I but there can't is a, there it. is at least a Isn't hug. He's super cute. Yeah, he's really cute. <laughs> he has huge eyes. He's very shiny. 
Is he yeah. just moist? Oh yes. Um, so amphibians have to stay moist. They do have lungs and they do have some gular breathing. You can see his throat going back and forth like that, pulling the air in and out. Mm -hmm. But um, they also breathe through their skin. They have air exchange through their skin. And if it dries out, then they die. They can't breathe Suffocate. and can't do their thing anymore. Bummer. Okay, wait, did you say why you know it's a male? So he's a little bit smaller, and um, he has you know specialized little graspers on his feet. Mm, for the hugging. <laughs> for the hugging. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Little, little I love how he like, he like puts his little feet yeah. together. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's conniving there. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ooh. Oh, sorry. I moved. Whoa, you, I moved pretty fast. Your legs are much longer than they look. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. These guys are great jumpers, and they are tree frogs. So they live up in the trees, and they use their little sticky pads to... You have the <laughs> narrowest <laughs> hips. Thank you. You have, like, no <laughs> pelvis. <laughs> A little That's... tiny one. Yeah. Oh. And so he can stick, he can jump and then stick onto things. And Use a sticky. Yeah, sticky little pads. Um, yeah. You know, these guys are these guys are using a lot of uh, research because of those sticky pads. They want to see if we can use some of the nature's technology. For um, putting posters on walls. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whatever. What have you? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and they're actually used in, in other research, too. Uh, they have this uh, secretion that they have over their body. So amphibians are, are really prone to, he might want to jump on you. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're susceptible to like molds and, and, and fungal infections because they have this really moist skin. And uh, um, it's killing off a lot of amphibians. It's, it's a big issue. But white tree frogs, they are not declining. They're actually doing really good in the wild because they have this cool secretion um, that has antibacterial and antiviral properties. And so scientists are going, so why aren't you dying too? And so they're, they're finding this out nice. and they're, they're using it in HIV research and other different Different kinds of research, um, like a, a hunger suppressant and stuff like that. Hunger like, suppressant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff with these guys, and they breed really easily in captivity. They they lay like up to three hundred eggs at a time, and yeah. and they're just really calm. And you're not into jumping today, bud, huh? You're into what crawling though. Inspires it to jump. Just do you want better scenery? Who knows? Do you Maybe want better flies scenery? Over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fun when we bring him out to public presentations and we'll, you know, we'll have like um, a volunteer come up and we'll be going to hand them off and he'll like jump onto their face or something. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hold him? Yeah. All right. Do you want to wet my hands? Yes. Ah, oh, spray bottle. Yes. Get a nice wet layer there for you. And the reason that... Um... Cool, huh? We do the wet, the reason we do the wet layer is because our skin is kept nice and, and supple by oils and amphibians are water-based, so we don't want to, let me see him wipe his eye off. <laughs> um, we don't want to get the oils onto his skin because it could clog his pores and it'd be difficult for him to breathe and he can absorb, if you like wear lotion or something, he can absorb all those chemicals and mm -hmm. it's not, not very good. So we always try and put a water barrier and, so if you guys are out there um, you're catching frogs and toads and salamanders, make sure you like put your hands in, in the water before you handle them and make sure they're near water after you let them go. And so with most of the animals you have at Animal Wonders, they are not good pets. Like you would not want someone to. A lot of times, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a tricky one. Like what makes a good pet? I'd rather ask the question, what makes a good human owner or human companion? Because that's, that's like, <laughs> Go, buddy. That's like the the real um, definer there of like, is this animal and this right. human going to cohabitate well? Are both going to be happy and healthy? So these guys are a really common pet, partly because they they breed so easy that they're cheap, mm -hmm. and they are very forgiving with temperature and humidity and food sources um, and handling, and they don't get stressed out really easy. Um, so basically, they're really hardy. So people have them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, well, that's good. That loved. makes a good pet. I mean, Lindsay wants one. <laughs> so they could make a, a good pet for the, the right person that wants yeah. to, to care for them. And they Is this are like they, max they're size. Food. So they're called dumpy tree frogs for a reason. Um, you don't look they, dumpy. Yeah. Yeah. So <gasps> he, he goes backward. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, you're, do you want to hold it? Sure. Yeah, don't miss out on this. Can we <laughs> Here you go. Would you like some water? 
Okay, hello, little stumpy. dumpy stumpy. Oh, oh, sticky. There you go, buddy. Okay, dumpy tree frog, they got their nickname because they love to eat. They, they just love to eat and they'll eat lots of different things. And it's, um. and it's adorable when they eat. So they have their, their tongue is attached to the, the front of their mouth and they'll jump towards, say it's a, like a cricket or something like that. They'll jump towards it and they'll stick their tongue out and they'll grab it and they'll pull it in their mouth. But if it's a little bit big, say it's like a big cricket or cockroach or something like that, they'll, take, they'll get into their mouth and they'll take both hands and like shove it in their mouth. And <laughs> it's like these, it's just, it's, it's so fun to watch. And so people are like, oh, they get this cute animal and then they like feed it and feed it and feed it and feed it, and feed it because it's super cute. Mm -hmm. And so they get big fatty deposits because they're not, they're, you know, they're spoiled. They're just sitting there. They're not having to run away from predators and, and go and hide and move from light and dark and, and mm -hmm. go and find their own food. So um, they're sedentary and they get lots and lots of food. So, so they get, they get these big fatty deposits on their back of their, their right behind their eyes there. And so they look like they're like big dumpy little dudes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, do, we, we do not overfeed him, and so he, he's, uh, and he's a male, so he's a little bit smaller. He can climb up there if you're comfortable. He's good. Ooh, ooh, nice ooh, move. He, won't, he won't often fall. Yeah. <laughs> he's very sticky. <laughs> One little toe, and he Are can you around. Are you going to find a female friend? Um, probably not because... You don't want a bunch of dumpy tree We frogs. don't want 300 babies to have to find responsible homes for. These guys aren't social um, in the mm -hmm. wild. They just come together to mate and then they oh. do their own thing. So there's no like like beneficial like f mental stimulation for him to have a companion. Um, mm -hmm. And they the females are bigger. So the female could end up trying to eat him or you know like yeah they mm. Mm. and they, they could not be compatible like. They might not like each other. Yeah. So lots of complications just, and no. Just, <laughs> no reason, like, <laughs> where are you going? Hold <laughs> on. There you go. All right. Guesses on why they have huge eyes. For bug finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are also, are they nighttime creatures? Yeah. Nocturnal. And so they have limited color and detail. And um, funny. so they need to see something moving. So they have big eyes so they can see the movement anywhere. And if they see it, they'll jump and go grab it. But also another reason. So their tongue is attached to the tip of their mouth, like the front part of their mouth there. Our tongue is like down the back and we use it to swallow our food and push our food down. Um, but they do not use their tongue to help them swallow. Instead, they use their eyeballs. So they shove their eyeballs into their head to push the food down yeah. their throats? Also known as blinking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they when I blink, blink, my eyeballs do not get shoved into my head. And so they like, they told, when they blink, it's totally like their eyeballs, yeah, get pushed to the back of their throat and they push whatever food is in their mouth down oh, their throat. Okay, weird. I'm just gonna say, the fact that we know this because someone has done the research mm -hmm. on frog eyeball yep. blinking yep. is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Am I like... Well, I don't know if they did the research or if they just watched. They could have just watched. And also, they, you can <sighs> dissect animals without, like, major... Without having to submit to the review board? Lots. Quite so a much. ton. Are you, jo are are you jostling him? him? Jiggling <laughs> him a little bit. Just to see what he does. Just to see the mind. mind. Like, he would jump off. If he hated that, he'd, yeah. like, he'd jump off. Yeah. He was a jiggle. Yeah, Whenever I bring an animal on and I know that you're going to be here, I'm like, oh, I need to look up the, you know, the, the reproduction of this animal. Um, and Aww, thank you. <laughs> it's actually probably one of the... Let's not... Let's not, let's not <laughs> hey. I'm, just, I'm just experimenting. <laughs> These guys are not easily stressed out, so he's... You, you, you said you're that. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe you shouldn't have a sex research institute. <laughs> oh. Look how cute he is. Hi, buddy. You can jump if you want to. You gonna jump? <gasps> Good jump. Nice oh, one. I wish I had my, my slow mo camera nice out for one. that. That was a little jump. Yeah. Oh, is he jump farther than that? Yes. Yeah, we were at a. Uh, um, oh, good there one. There you go. Ah, uh, so it puts up its. He puts up his back pads right before he jumps? Puts up? What do you mean? He yeah. brought up his back pads like this mm -hmm. and then launched oh. himself to get some momentum? I think so. I wasn't do you want to do it again? Enough. We're going to study your behaviors. <laughs> no. Reproduction is probably the least studied thing in animals as well, uh, especially when they're not a social species and they only come together like you know during their mating season to mate and then they leave each other because it's hard to follow an animal around and, and discover that. So there's a lot of animals that we just they're like we think they mate anywhere between November and May. 
Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're pretty uh, sure these animals procreate. Well, you, you, they, they have babies around this time. Yeah, you go. Do you want yeah. them? Um, but then, okay, so the other story is um, we were at a, a senior home one time, and I was showing Stumpy off and um, bringing him through and all the, you know, everyone, they have glasses, and they're, they're looking real closely at him. And I had mm-hmm. this old lady, and she was so interested. And he, they, he jumped right onto her face and, like, slapped right onto her glasses. And I'm panicking because it's, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's an old lady. And, and often the stereotype with them is that they, like, they don't like snakes and amphibians and stuff Squirmy like that. Squirms. Yeah. But she was just like, oh! <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and she was like giddy that she had a frog on her face and it was the best. Yeah. I'll take a face full of frog. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> you need a thumbnail? Yeah, right? Do you want to see? We can show off the sticky pads on glass. Oh yeah? Did you bring some glass? Yeah, on your face. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, no. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Good hey, job, buddy. You happy? Good job. <laughs> that way. <laughs> oh. Can I go see the hair? Do you have gel in your hair? I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! We need cutie. Oh. There you it go. It blinks. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Happier. Uh, do you guys have any questions about him? He's about six years old. Okay. Um, they How can live tell? about fifteen. Um, we've had him since he was since he was before he was mature. Okay. And these guys, they are, um, you know, pretty. They don't get stressed out by social socialization with humans, um, so not easily. Um, so they will actually. Do you look? Oh. Did you see it? <laughs> It put its back. I told pause. Looking again. Darn it. Pushes pause. Off with it. Pads. And pushes off with his like uh, something. Ankles. Huh. Mm. Okay. We'll have to look at that. Now you know. Yeah. yeah. What the signal is. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, buddy. Um, so they they will hang out with and they will um, tell you when they're upset by you know, like trying to get away or <laughs> or squeaking when they're so they'll scream if they're really scared and they'll squeak oh. if they're irritated. Hmm. Um, so. So there are some good communications where you know that you should stop and put them back. Have you heard it, Nick? No, he's never sweet Him? with us. No. We don't generally do a lot of what Hank was doing, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pretty much like, this is he not the perp- animal. Okay, let's put happy. it back and let him be. He was, he was fine. <laughs> he was fine. <sighs> good jump in. He's doing really good. Like, yeah. I'm proud of him. Good job, buddy. Good job, I'm buddy. so happy. I know. I he's love just, your he's animal. He's a really good animal. <laughs> I like great. his feet. Right? He's great. It's weird because, like, they stick, but then they don't. So, it's like, it's you like, can make them stick or not. I don't think it's, like, suction cup and then releases. It's more like he has muscles that he can yeah. just easily pull mm-hmm. it off. And they're just wet. They're, like, wet pads, but they have, like, a structure to them that allow it to, to hold on yeah. more firmly. Yeah. Because, like, when he was holding onto my finger, it was, like... Pretty but sticky, then, but then exactly. But he's walking so he, around, like... like he just lifts it off. Yeah, so he can like move his toe a little bit more to create more of a suction yeah. um, and grip and then just pull it off. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I have another question. Mm-hmm. It changes colors, right? Yeah. He changes colors. He does, yeah. Um, so they can't, it's not like chameleons that do it by mood. Um, it's actually uh, depending on the, the, the light in the room or and the warmth. So right now he's been in a warm area with lots of light, so he's bright green. And if he goes into like a darker, shady area, which is a little colder, he'll turn brown. Hmm. And that's beneficial because he's nocturnal and he's going to be sleeping during the day. And he'll wake up here and there during sleep period. But if, you know, a, a shadow comes across, he'll turn brown, just like everything mm-hmm. else is going to be in the shadow. And then if it's bright, everything's going to be brighter. Um, it also helps him thermoregulate. Um, so if he is cold, Turning a darker color is going to help him warm up faster. How did you know he changed colors? Because I watch Animal Wonders. Hank. YouTube.com <laughs> slash Animal Wonders Montana. <laughs> <laughs> and you said in, in the name, there's the word white. White street frog. John White is the one that first like brought oh. specimens to study. Um, and the so person. it's like, yeah, gotcha. yeah, named after. So he's, he's a, a green. Australian green tree frog. Yeah, but he's... He's green sometimes and brown other times. And they have cute little white speckles on their back end. Aren't uh, frogs 
legs a delicacy? Probably not those frogs' legs. These ones are all small. Tiny ones. Yeah. yeah. We won't eat your legs. Yeah. <laughs> I've had frogs' legs before. Were they the good? Big ones. They seem I mean, like they'd no. be like, like, like air chicken. Fine. They're just food. Okay. I mean, it's not like, definitely not okay. a delicacy. Okay. But I don't know that it was prepared particularly well sure. either. Sure. But like bullfrogs, big frogs. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Like their legs are like. Yeah. Like dark meat chicken. Like a small chicken wing. Yeah. Your legs look delicious. I've never had frog legs. Did you say they look delicious? <laughs> I want to nibble on your legs. I'll take, I'll take them back now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, bud. Hey. You're so good. Where are you going? You go back to Lindsay? Mm -hmm. And jump. Do it. See? Let's see. See the pads he up? Is sticking it. He is sticking his feet up. Pads up. You and me, we're the same. What? Oh. Big how, old how, eyes. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, yeah. Look at the little webs on his feet. Do you think he could swim? Yes. He can? No. Mm -mm. Ah, he it's good to know that there are some animals that can't swim. Because I got in a lot of trouble by saying armadillos couldn't. It turns out they can. <laughs> they can. They can swim. Well, you posted that image of a bat swimming that yeah. was awesome. Well, yeah. I bet any animal would try it, but these guys will very easily drown if they get put in a big pool of water. Okay. Mm. But they like they like hang. They still have to get wet, and so they'll, they'll like sit in little like leaves up in the trees. They're like little jacuzzis. <laughs> so then the oh, it's like a brooch. You're natural. You're just like yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, the eggs and the sperm, when they come out, they're not in water. They are in water, still water. They have to, they do oh. go down and hang out like still, there's like a little bit of still water here and they'll like hang out on a little Just leaf puddles. right there. Mm. Do their little hug. Mm. Yeah. An amphibian that can't swim. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> it happens. Apparently. <laughs> Everything happens. I want to go see Lindsay again. It's love. You're like <laughs> my frog prince. <laughs> Don't kiss him though. Don't kiss him. No. You got lipstick on. No. <laughs> Yay! See, it's love. <laughs> Cutie. That's really good. Hey, Stumpy. <laughs> Thanks for visiting today. Wanna go? So go say hi to him. Okay. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. You are an excellent guest and are very cute. You are both also excellent guests. Thank you for joining us. If you want to know more about what Jesse's up to, youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. And Lindsay has a new podcast called the Sexplanations Podcast, also at youtube.com slash sexplanations, which talks all about sex. We talk about sex. Yeah. And it's awesome. It's good. Get good curious show. with us. Learn more. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we are at youtube.com slash scishow. And we appreciate you being here. <laughs>